Um, the way I see it, all right, those are three. Okay, I'm going to answer the second question first, which is um, if trans amory and trans dating, if they're mutually exclusive, so trans, I think. I'm, I'm sorry, just to reiterate, possibly, um, trans amory and trans advocacy or talking about trans people's lives, talking about trans issues as human rights issues, as opposed to, hey, I love trans women, I want to date a trans woman. Um, what can a person be effective and welcomed um, talking about one without exclusively also including the other? Like, is there a space for both? Um, or should I, one not be touched on unless the other exists at uh, the same space and time? I don't feel like it's our place to answer that, <laughs> to be honest. It's really up to the there's group. a place where niggas is at. We gonna have to talk yeah, about it. Right. Like man. that's not for us to answer. <laughs> but what I will say is that from what I gather is that the, the trans women, black trans women specifically, they they want like Hope expressed earlier, like she 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 she's in talks with, with her sisters about, you know, just having a basic want to be treated much like any other woman or any other person for that matter. Um, and when, when, until we get to the point where we're, we're um, let me go back to the question. So I think trans Amory in a context of dating and um, being very upfront about that and being transparent about that and very clear about your intention in situating spaces like that could very well be um, advocacy to some trans people. To some people, to some trans people, I would assume that it, it's not entirely, and that there's more or something else that needs to be done. I don't know if we can answer that specifically, um, but uh, I think sometimes um, it can look like it, it. I think it is a form of advocacy to 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 very much stand in this idea that trans women are human beings, <laughs> human beings, the very basic fundamental uh, human beings um, worthy of love, worthy of things that humans are worthy of. And when we can't even have that conversation of uh, humanizing conversations, because I think oftentimes our conversations, um, the conversations that center around the experiences of black trans women are about sex, death parts and we have to get away from those conversations because that dehumanizes the context of the experiences until we get to that point where we're just engaging in conversations about love and and and, and, and intimacy and romance then we can't it's we it's not our answer our question to answer whether or not um there's a distinction between um our amory to them is whether or not it's uh advocacy. That's what I feel. So it's interesting for me. I, I agree with your reasoning, but I disagree with your answer. And what I mean by that is... Are you, are you speaking to Malouie? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I, I disagree with your answer in that I feel like, yes, your trans amory can inform or even be the intention behind your advocacy or your allyship of trans rights. What it can't be is like speaking to all those things that you were just talking about, Malouie, um, like the, the parts, the breaking down, the hypersexualization, right. all these things that can be tied up in that trans amory and kind of be, become that arrowhead, so to speak. And what is that? Um, and and that what it means for me, it, well, what it kind of sounds like for me is like when we talk about defending black women, it's like, oh yeah, I'll be out here in these streets defending black women, ah ah, when they happen to be my mom, my sister someone that I have this relationship with, someone that I think is, you know, good looking or that I'm attracted to and all these things surrounding, oh, I can do this work when there's some kind of connection as opposed to I'm doing this work on behalf of a human being that needs no justification. I believe them. I trust their stories, their firsthand experience. There's no need for me to validate that. So to have that like trans amory piece it will help inform that and can even get you in the gate so to speak as far as like learning like what that work can look like for yourself but it shouldn't be like that driving force of oh i'm doing it to this end i agree i totally yeah that, mm -hmm. I, 
I was going to say that was more so my point. I think to clarify, like when you're to me, uh, when you are having productive conversations about like parts and sex and death, that I when I think of Amory, I, that's not what I think about. I think about um, actual intimacy and romance and connection and all of those deeper experiences. I don't really it can include it, but in terms of this, this larger question of whether or not that there's a distinction between the amorous side of it and the advocacy, that's more so where I was coming at. So I think we're more on the same page in terms of the answer, but I, I just need to make that clear that that's what I meant about, that's what I had in mind when, when thinking of the term amory. Gotcha. I think for me, um, to answer your question, like, uh, and I've been I've been sitting here trying to figure out how to not make it problematic, but I think that it is still problematic, and it's something I'm gonna have to sit with myself on for a minute. But part of me, um, because one of my sisters that's a little bit more like fuck these niggas if they can't, <laughs> um, said something to me about a month ago um, that kind of stuck with me, and I feel like I understand it a little bit better now because it's just kind of like, well, actually, um. A male friend of she said this to me as well, another trans amorous male that I was speaking to. And what they both conveyed to me is that when the the basis of your conversation stems from this place of amory, there's an expectation that your advocacy is led by that Emory, right? And so when the basis of your conversation starts there, there's the expectation from other people that the reason that you are doing this is because of those things. And I think that the reason why Lee gets away with it more so is because even if he does have an affinity for trans women, the basis of his argument started there. It started with humanizing us. It started with trans women are women. It started with the rights of women, whereas what I think now, which I believe is the problematic piece, depending on the way that I say it, I don't know, I'm still trying to figure my way out through it, feel through it, right? Um, I think that a lot of guys start with the Amory and then get upset when people dig at it, right? Because it's like, okay, so tell us more, tell us more and, and tell us more. Um, and it's like, but wait, I'm done talking about that. Like, no, because now we're feeling like you have to be that person because that's what you started off as. It, it goes back to when I was talking to one of my uh, YouTube people way back in the day before Hope Disguise was Hope Disguise. And I was like, how do you feel about my videos? And he's like, well, girl, what I'm seeing is that you got some nasty reads. Like you can read a bitch down for 30 minutes. But the question is, do you want to be known as the girl that people go to when they want to see a good read? And I think that trans amorous men have to kind of start in that place as well, in your messaging. Do you only want to be known as the man that likes trans girls, or do you want to be known as the man who sees the humanity in people, right? And some of those people happen to be trans. And I think that that, in, in answering your question, I do think that because of those things that your amory and your advocacy do have to be separate your amor and your advocacy do have to live in two separate places because when they live together, there's expectations that are, that all, almost need to be fulfilled by the people that you're advocating for based on the reason and the thought process for why they think you are advocating, right? If I'm advocating for black men coming from this space of love as a black woman, there's an assumption and there's an expectation that I'm going to be with a black man that I love. It's kind of, so, okay, to put it in perspective for all of us, right? We've all seen that black man that be out there like, black women, black queen, black power, I'ma be, da, 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 da. <laughs> And then two weeks later, we see him with a Karen. And we all be like, my nigga. You know what I'm saying? And, and so it's one of those things where like, because his advocacy comes from this seeming place of, of love for black women and love for black queens and admiration for black women, when he's not with a black woman, we'd be like, nigga, what? And so when your advocacy from trans women stems from this place of, yes, I would marry a trans woman. I have no problem. Da -da 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 -da. Then there's an expectation that your advocacy is 
sort of fueled by that love rather than just fueled by your appreciation for human life, your appreciation for people, for people being seen as people. Um, and while it might suck, and I think that that's the thing that's got me like, Ugh, um, is that they do, they just have to live separately. And your messaging, um, it just has to come from, from that place. It has to come from that place of trans people are human and, and we need to treat them this way. Trans people and trans women deserve these things because of their humanity. Fuck what I like in the bedroom. Fuck what I want to do with my personal life. Because trans women are fucking human people, and especially black trans women, because I'm a black man, are fucking black people, they deserve to be included in X, Y, and Z. Um, and not coming from this place of emotional despair, because the second that your, your messaging, or I mean, not, not your messaging, but the second that your lived actions don't reflect what your messaging is saying, that's when people start to be like, and going back to something that you said a little bit earlier, for me, I feel like the, the whole idea of a man who's two weeks in teaching a man who is one week in is the blind leading the blind. Because when you're two weeks in, you're still learning and you're still fucking up. And what's happening is that you're learning as you go. And now you're trying to teach people with the one week of experience that you have before them. And that doesn't work, which is why so many fucking men get their ass cussed out because that is the, that's been the, the rhetoric. Mm -hmm. That's that's been the thing that y'all have been doing because y'all think that that's the cool thing. Like, oh, I've, I've been doing this with this one girl for a month. So let me go and teach another dude what that was been working for me. And then you realize at the end of your month that you done fucked up majorly, but you've already taught this other dude what you've been doing. And so now he getting cussed out, you getting cussed out. Y'all don't like trans women. Trans women don't like y'all and everybody is trade. You know what I'm saying? And so I feel like there, if, if, if that, I, I, that's why I say, somebody has to be able or be willing to take the, the the leap and say, I'm going to make these mistakes. I'm going to make these wins. I'm going to take these L's through experience. And then I'm going to let my brothers know based on my experience, what I learned. I can't be out here trying to teach makeup classes if I've only done one face. I can't be out here trying to tell people how to build their platform if I just started last month. I can't, like, it, it's kind of like the same thing that we had when Kylie Jenner got that whole, like, first billionaire bullshit. Bitch, where? You were born into money. Your sister fucked somebody. You got a piece of that pie. You were on a television show. You also flipped that money and made something else. You didn't work for that. You didn't build that from the ground up like Oprah did. You were you like, yeah, you a billionaire, but bitch, you ain't really a billionaire. You don't know what it takes to really grind and hustle that out. Like, that was low-key handed to you. People who like your brand and people who like your family's brand and people who want to make money off of your name handed that to you. That wasn't something that you grinded out of the muscle. And I think that that's what a lot of trans women just want to see is good, bad, or indifferent. Work through that shit. Like, let it, like, if you want the men that you are working with, if you want other men to feel inspired, then work through that shit and let them see that. Let them see the, like, because it can't always be an L. You can't be waiting until you think you found the right person that's going to give you this win after win after win so that when it, when it does come to the light, y'all have this perfect fucking relationship and everybody thinks that that, because that to me is dishonest. That part of it is the part that, makes men feel like oh it's gonna be gravy boats and all that and that's not what it is because they're every girl is different every like there are gonna be so many nuances so when you come out and y'all have this perfect fucking relationship niggas are gonna feel like oh i should be able to do that and when they hit a girl up in the dms and she'd be like uh no it's gonna be like nigga you tricked me because you told me <laughs> like you and your girlfriend don't never do this you know you know and, like there has to be, I think that that's the growth is being able, if you do want to do, or when you decide that you want to do work in trans amory, you can base it off of experience. You can actually say in my past relationship or in my current relationship, what I am learning, what I have learned versus being able to say, well, what I can guess, what I can assume, what I think, because you don't know, you ain't never been there. You know what I'm saying? And so I think that that to me for what you were saying as far as like guys kind of like leading each other on that week by week, I just feel like that's irresponsible because, it, it, you know, it, it's just, 
it's some toddler shit. Like two toddlers can't teach each other week by week because you just burnt your hand on the stove. And by the time you realize that it hurts, the other person already sticking his hand in the oven. Um, <laughs> you know, and so. I think toddlers are really, really good uh, teachers of each other. That's why like, kids go to playgrounds. They learn how to uh, be in, in social settings with people who are on the same level as them. But I was kind of just making like a example that was very general. I didn't mean like. No, I, I, I get it. But I, I wanted to. I, I feel you though. <laughs> Cause that made me furrow my brow real hard. I was like, what? <laughs> like, oh no. But um, as it pertains to everything else that, that's been going on, I definitely think that your your advocacy, I, I think as hard as it is for me to admit, I do, I think that for myself and for a lot of the women that I um, find and seek family in, it might be easier for us to receive a lot of trans amorous men's advocacy if, their trans amory took a backseat. I guess that kind of brings it full circle back to Conscious Lee. Not to keep bringing the brother up, but that man came in completely like, yo, trans women are women. It's a human rights issue. And then eventually it still led into like, okay, nigga, so where are you at? And if you go into his comments, it, it very much turns into like, okay, I want to marry you. Or, okay, yeah, where you at? Or do you like trans women? And he'll be like, mm. he'll, he'll set it down because obviously he's married, like we talked about. But it just seems as though it is impossible to separate those two. And I'm not saying that they should be separate. Mm -hmm. The only thing that makes me feel like possibly it might be a good thing if they were able to be is the fact that you do run into what seems like a brick wall when somebody is advocating for the human rights part. Because I feel like, to be straight up, I understand the side of trans women wanting that, wanting that what they see other women having. Obviously, everybody wants to eventually have a relationship that's going to be fulfilling for them that's going to let them like chris said ride off into the sunset mm -hmm. but i feel like it's very difficult to kind of have these conversations or to see these examples or to see people be ready when a lot of people are not even on board with the idea of like hey let's advocate for trans people when you see the trump administration doing some bullshit hey, if your friend says some fucking transphobic shit, you should check them because that shit is not cool. I think that to be straight up with it, the conversation around trans amoring is very important, but it's very thin yeah. because it almost is the same conversation. Kind of like uh, Malou was um, kind of, and I, I don't want to actually put words in your mouth. I'll ask if this was kind of what you were saying, but it's almost like if we're not talking about the human rights, then we just jump into like parts and, and loving and how we get down and sex and, and stuff like that. So it's like, if, if that conversation precedes the, yo, I 100% look at this trans person, whether it be a trans woman or a trans man, or even a non-binary person, no matter who they are, I look them in the eye and I see a human being and I see their soul resonating through the fire in their eyes. And it's kind of hard to perceive the loving relationship when most people are not on board with the human rights part. So it would be as important as it is to have the conversations around trans amory. I think it can be almost like a very thin and a conversation that is preceding what I feel like is the actual concrete of the fucking foundation of what will actually create men who are able to be in loving relationships, which is the part that says you're trans and you're human. And I see that and I, and I don't treat you as some other kind of, as an other. Because I feel like that's still where a lot of people are at. So that's kind of why I asked that question to be like, is it possible for those two things to be separate? Because no matter which way it starts, if you start talking about Emory, then it's like, okay, that's what you're about. If you start talking about human rights, it's like eventually, okay, so where you at? Let the rubber meet the road. So it's almost like, I love the conversation around Emory because I am trans amorous and I do see myself in that relationship some beautiful day. Uh, but... I think that the human rights conversation has to happen and it has to happen in a major way before you see a bunch of people who are able to be like, you know what? Hell yeah. You know what? That person is a viable, a viable person that I would add into my dating pool because right now a lot of people are not even able to see trans women or trans men as people that they could relate to or want to be connected to in any sense. And that's fucked up. But that is the work that I feel like is just incredibly important above and beyond not above and beyond because it's not a comparison thing but it's just a matter of that has to happen before the real yo i met a trans person they told me that they were trans after we went on this fucking amazing date 
and I didn't fucking flip out because I believe in my heart of hearts that trans people are people, trans women are women. So, you know, I think that there needs to be a lot more of those conversations. And it's almost, it's almost shoots, it almost shoots, shoots it in the foot because it's almost like you can't do it unless you all the way ready to be in this relationship. Um, when I feel like the conversation that needs to happen is not that relationship part, even though that is beautiful and that would be an amazing ancillary um, thing to put on top to just really crown the whole situation to be like, boom, and that, now what? Mm-hmm. But I think that there's a whole lot more conversations that even are more important that are not happening to the degree that they need to happen. And it kind of sucks that what I'm hearing, it sounds like you've had a lot of people tell you that people should not even step into that space to have those human rights conversations unless they're ready to have the whole other side because it is the same coin, but it's the other side of the, it's the other side of the coin. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, I would love to be in a world where I see a bunch of people not being afraid to be associated to trans issues and talking about them. Um, and it's impossible for that to happen when it's kind of frowned upon when you're not doing the other, the B side of the damn tape. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's a lot of good tracks on that A side. We need to play the fuck out of them and get them lyrics out in the world to where they can get on the radio. And um, before we do that, you know, the B side cuts is, is not really gonna be something that people are gonna be able to hear yet, as far as I'm concerned. So I don't know, that's kind of why I pose that question to be like, are these two things different? Are they mutually excu- exclusive? Is there space for both of them or do they mess together at a certain point? But um, yeah, it was just, it was just a, if anybody has anything to add to that, um, or if y'all want to move on to some other shit, that's cool too. But I just think that it's interesting that we want to see people having these beautiful human relationships with trans people before people are having these conversations about trans people being human. And it's like- I want to yeah. flag for you that I think that a lot of the, because as I was listening to you talk, I think my my brain was just like, the problem is people are having these conversations. You like there are there are millions of conversations about trans. Like I said, there's a bunch of cisgender black women that are now having this conversation. There's a bunch of new black cisgender heterosexual men that are having this conversation. I right. think so let's, it, let's it, gets, it, it gets muddy though when mm. you know that somebody is trans amorous, right? Because I think that that at that point, that's when the girls are just like. We got enough people doing that. Like, so we need, if you if you gonna do this, then do this. Because we have, like, we're having our own conversations. We have enough allies that are out here also doing this. So if you're gonna step in the ring and you're gonna be talking about this, then you need to talk about this and educate the people on this because we have enough people talking about human rights. And I mean, honestly, in, in some spaces we do. We have more allies now than ever before. There's a bunch more people talking about trans rights that are not trans. Um, than ever, and we saw that with that huge turnout for black trans women in Brooklyn. And so we know that the allies are there. There are plenty of conversations about the humanity of trans people. I think that this kind of goes back to Malouie's point of the idea that sometimes we are looking for advocacy to show up in the, in, in the face of, of our intimacy, of how people show up for us romantically, because th- those are the conversations that are not happening. And those are the questions that trans women are often left to answer. Like every interview I go on, somebody pops in and asks me some question that I can't answer about a a black trans amorous man or a trans amorous man, period. I'm just like, well, I'm not a trans amorous man, so I can't answer that for you. And I think that those are the questions that a lot of trans amorous men are not answering. Those are the conversations that a lot of trans amorous men are not, that's the advocacy that's not being done. Like people are like, while it's a slow trug, there are plenty of, of, of articles being written and videos being made and, and, and visibility happening for our humanity. What's not happening is the fact that we're not being seen as romantically worthy. And it's hard for us to keep trying, like, I feel like at this point, as, as, as a trans woman, I feel like I have to constantly justify whenever somebody invites me to a fucking space to talk about anything and they bring up like, so Hope, are you dating? And okay, so what about these men? And I'll have to fucking answer to them question. And then I can't be like, oh, well, you know, this is a great resource because then ain't no niggas out there that's dating girls that I can refer them to. Like, it's like, I, I and I'm, I'm sick of, of the look that I get 
because you just sat up here and you had this whole 35, 45 minute conversation with this person that low key probably still think that you a man in a wig or with, with a good contour. And then they ask you this conversation about the way that love shows up for you and you either sit there with egg on your face because love doesn't show up for you or if it is showing up for you it's showing up for you in a way that you're embarrassed about to be completely transparent with y'all there was a point in my life where literally I, I I had a whole relationship that wasn't a fucking relationship and I couldn't talk about the relationship and I was embarrassed when anybody asked me to bring it up and there are so many other trans women that are doing the same thing there are some of us that have had a piece of trade for fucking years, should be in a common law marriage by now, that we couldn't talk about or that we can't talk about because it's just like, and, and it becomes embarrassing because the conversations around that are just not happening and we don't know the answers to those questions. I can't tell somebody why they are attracted to a person who has boobs and, and, and a penis. I can't tell somebody why men find my aura attractive. I can't explain to somebody what the romantic um, banter that happens back and forth in a man's mind when he sees me. I, I can't explain that to people. All I can explain is my side. But what does happen for us a lot of times is that we're left looking dumb because it's just like, you just sat up here and you said all of these amazing things about yourself, but all of these men that y'all claim love y'all, like they don't love y'all for real because it's never happening in the open and it never happened out loud like people know plenty of stories about the ways that trans women you know are out here screwing people's husbands or have all of these trades on the low key but I think that in some cases especially when you have those transphobic cis women they they love to get a laugh at the fact that like yeah bitch you can do all of that shit behind closed doors but he will never marry you you can do all of that shit behind closed doors but sis every time I see you at the club you get a whole bunch of your gay friends Every time I see you out, the boys are taking pictures with you, but you, ne you there, a man will never take you where I can go. A man will never show up with you at church where, like my husband does. Like, and those are the conversations and that is the advocacy that I do think that as trans women, we miss. We don't get that opportunity to be advocated for in that way where men are just like, no, I love these women. Like, and, and, and here's why. And this is, you know, like, but there's plenty of stuff about human rights. And so while... I understand what you're coming from, Lex, and I get it completely. I think that the tiring part, and I think that the tiring conversation is that we get a lot of excuses about why trans amorous men can't do that part, but they're willing to do everything else. It's like, I, oh, we could talk about how, you know, you're a person and how you're amazing and da 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 but if you want me to sit back and talk and, and answer too many questions about the way that my love shows up now, we got to stop the conversation. Hold up, halt. Like, what you mean? Like, let's go back to this other thing over here because I'm not ready to have that conversation. And then it just makes trans women look dumb because then the people on the outside who don't understand that there is work that needs to be done just look at trans women like, see, and y'all think that these men really love you. They, they, they think that y'all men in wigs too, low key. Just look at their responses. And to some degree, we'd be like, damn. <laughs> like, I mean, well, she low-key right. Cause that it, that it happens every time. It happens every time. Like whenever a man is asked to speak romantically about trans women, if it doesn't immediately go to some super hypersexual shit, it's dismissed like it was with Lee. Like he might've been able to have a very like open and, and, and dope ass conversation about trans Amory, but he had to dismiss it because of what his wife wanted. There are plenty of men that might be able to have dope ass, um, really great conversations about trans Amory, but they dismissed it to talk about something that's easier because actually having to, like I said, it goes back to the defending question, actually having to defend your love, actually having to defend trans women, actually having to stand up for trans women is something that I don't feel like a lot of trans amorous men think is worth it. All right, my niggas, go ahead. Talk, like, <laughs> I'm gonna talk. Wait, I don't even know what that, how to follow that up. Well, anyways, yeah, I'm, I'm one of those people that can talk. I'm one of those I've been talking for a year and a half now. And in a relationship or nothing like that, but that's uh, I have been in a, a couple relationships, and something that I, I push a lot with the other guys that I talk to is, you know, be 
be very selective and be very sure about your decision. Don't go into something being self sell because I just think you, you're, you're kind of wasting, and I'm not about wasting people's time either. So, you know, it's, it's really just about dating with intent. And if you see that, you know, long, you know, like you said, oh, talking about, you know, that first date, and it's like, wow, this could be the one. If you're not feeling that this could be the one, like, get the fuck out. And, and, and I usually tell a lot of guys to do that. And, and like I said before, I think a lot of the problem still is there are just two communities that are completely missing each other. They're, they're, they're just not connecting. The girls are fucking with all these dudes that are DL and want to be trained, don't want to be with them in public. And then all the guys is out here earnestly looking for a healthy relationship that could lead to marriage. Uh, or, or just some other version of, you know, you've got other different kinds of relationships out there, but a healthy relationship, um, you know, those guys are in the DMs of the girls with OnlyFans accounts on Instagram. They're on there. The women that they're finding is the chicks on, you know, these dating apps that are just trying to get another client. And, and, and so so they're, in a, they're, they're dealing with an audience that doesn't really want what they want. So I, I just... I really think that's where the problem is. It's just two very small crowds. Just they're, they're not hitting each other. And when and when they do, it's fucking amazing. And that's how some of my homies got married. Like it, it really does work out. It's just it's really and it's been my experience because I've been looking and, and it's just really hard to find somebody who is open to a monogamous relationship and who's mentally ready for it. Who's not here not here to play games, not, uh, you know, who's, who's done the work themselves in their mind to deal with some of the trauma that they've experienced, to move on to a way where they're ready to accept somebody loving them in a, in a healthy manner. So it's, it's, it's just, it, it is unfortunate that, that we just can't get it together as a community. Yeah, I mean, so, I, think, I, hope, I think your point is spot on, you know, when I was listening to the conversation, I think there's a lot of cis men and cis women. There's a lot of cis men who date cis black sisters who are not advocates and allies for black women in general. Like they, they are in these relationships and there's no advocacy and there's no voice around black women, period. Um, and so I think in listening to the conversation, I do in some sense think that Amory and advocacy are separate. And I do agree that I think advocacy in some sense it has become socially acceptable to be socially conscious like seeing people as human is the trend i mean that's why white folks have co-opted black lives matter like okay yes people and humans matter now like we as a society i'm not saying that it shows up but that language and that verbiage is pretty standard at this point in time i think when i've heard this conversation is that's great to have advocates but you know the love the the affection the lifelong commitment to being in relation is where black men are not showing up for our black sisters in this conversation. And so, I mean, I think that's a, that's a clear point. I mean, I even think about some of my experiences and some of the conversations I've had and some relationships or some dates or some opportunities. And for me, it was really easy to walk away. I was like, okay, like I, you know, and I saw, cause I thought there was this life happening. Like there, I took for granted, I think, a lot of the things that you talked about tonight. And so I appreciate the perspective. I think it really helps me think more intuitively about the role of advocacy versus, you know, being amorous and what does that actually mean? And that we there is a need for black men to be more engaged about loving and affectionately caring of our like an affectionate care for our trans sisters, not just caring for them in their humanity. Like I, I love you from an affectionate, intimate place. Um, and I think that's necessary. And we've not flexed that muscle. And I don't even know if it needs to be representation from that. I think it's really just more so being willing to be vulnerable in your love and like being able to remove stigma from love. And that's a hard process. Um, but I mean, for me, and I think for me, I've also been, I've struggled again to, like I share, like center the transness. Like that's not been a thing I've thought about. I've not thought about, I'm not, I've not been out here like I'm, I'm looking for a trans sister. Like that's not been my thing. I've made some great relationships. I've gone on some great dates. I've made some great connections. Um, and so when they ask me, like, well, why are you here? I'm like, because we vibe. Like, we vibe, we've hung out, we've DM'd, we've gone on dates, we've been in the club together. I've enjoyed it. You know, well, what's your what's your hidden secret? Like, what is your where's your, what's your baggage? Because this, you ain't you definitely ain't interested in me. And I'm like, absolutely. Like, why, 
But I understand there's shit before me that came up that why they're entering that in this place. And so for me, instead of me just running away every time that happened, I need to have better context about why I got that type of response. Um, and that's the thing. So I appreciate the dialogue. The, the, I think that um, that that spot on is um, a lot of a, a lot of the men when engaging in, in in those ways, they forget that. And I like it's one of those things that I like to have conversation with men about all the time. It's just like don't act like y'all don't know that there's fuck boys out there, right? Don't act like y'all don't know that niggas are out here doing women dirty, cis, trans, or indifferent, right? And so especially as trans women, especially when you're a trans amorous man, like it's a difference when you're a piece of trade or when you're like a DL guy trying to fig- find your way through it. But as trans amorous men, y'all know what we go through. Y'all know how these boys play on us and, and do all of this stuff. And so like a lot of the time that energy that you get is coming from a space of, I'm trying to make sure that you're not that person that I've dealt with 45 other times. And while you think that it's unfair for me to put you through that test, it's necessary for me and my my emotional space, my my energy to, to make sure that this person understands. And I think um, a lot of my sisters will probably agree with this point is that you understand that even if I'm the most cis, passing binary trans woman in the world that you understand that I am still a trans woman. And so approaching me and the way that we are going to engage with one another is going to be different. There are going to be different insecurities that you have to deal with when you get with me because I'm trans. There's a different way that I see things and perceive conversations. And there's a different way that I'm going to take in information because I am trans. And so while I, a lot of people ask me like, well, Hope, will you ever just like drop the trans and just like, when are you ever just going to be just a woman? And I'm like, I am a woman. But it's imperative for me to remind you that I'm trans because when we're walking down Hollywood Boulevard and some dudes start talking shit and I am immediately triggered, even if they're not talking about me, I don't want you to get mad at me for feeling insecure. I need you to understand that in her life, those snickers and those laughs did used to be about her. And that those are things that she still has to work through and get over, right? And um yeah. I need you to understand that when I'm asking you 50 million questions, that is coming from a place of when I didn't ask those questions before in the past, I've, I've been broken. And so having somebody who I feel like is willing to answer those questions does make me feel safe. It does make me feel secure. It makes me feel like you're here for real. Um, with that being said, I want to ask a question that I think only you all can answer, which is how how do you think your amory shapes your masculinity and and what is it like for you when you tell people that you are trans amorous and what are some of the 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 stuff that you go through that you wish that trans women understood as well Hmm. Uh, for me i i don't know how this is going to sound but um my truth is that it doesn't inform my masculinity at all um Again, I always enter into intimate relationships with this understanding like I am coming into this knowing who I am and accepting you as you are. And while I would want for you to, to, to know who you are as well, I don't think what you know of yourself informs what I know of myself, if that makes any sense. Um, like I, I, me specifically, I don't, I don't, I don't play into roles that 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 feed this idea of like oh uh to make you feel more womanly I'm going to do this thing or in order for me to feel more masculine like you should do like I don't have any of that I think it was um Jamie that expressed like this um n- not centering the transness and the amory. Um, while it's important to understand the experiences of the people or person that you're um, sharing intimate space with, uh, like it, whether it's, this is a black person I'm in a relationship, and intersectional identities, whatever, uh, having that understanding is very important, but in terms of uh, having, uh, having that identities influence or uh, inform uh, 
yourself. That doesn't, that's not a thing for me. So sometimes um, in my Amory, <clears throat> if I'm talking specifically about um, black trans women have, having amorous connections with them, the, the, the hard pill to swallow is that I won't do things that validate your womanhood. That's not my responsibility. You should have that already, much like I should have my own understanding of self. While of course I will affirm the person that you are, love on the person that you are, affirmation will, will be the, 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 the mode of the relationship, but the validation part and, and it informing what I know of myself or how I identify is neither here nor there for me. It's just either semantics or for other people to understand. But what I, I, I understand what it is, who it is that I am, what it is that I like, how I show up in the world. And while people might have perceptions of that or might um, tack language to that, um, to understand it themselves, that doesn't so in, in, in having um, trans amorous experiences, it, do, it doesn't at all influence or inform what I know to be of my masculinity or otherwise, Oops. if that makes sense. Okay, I wanted to uh, drop in on that one next because uh, I believe the, my, my trans amory has greatly matured my masculinity. Um, I was raised in a church, you know, in a, and in a black community, toxic masculinity is just the brand that we're raised on uh, uh, throughout our lives. So it really, I really took a hard look at myself and, you know, I will admit, you know, and I talked to a lot of trans amorous guys, there is still a lot of that toxic, homophobic masculinity within public trans amorous men. You know, a lot of the guys are like, well, I don't know, like, I like her, but then this other one, I don't know, she's too masculine, I don't like that, and, that, and that's too close to being gay, I don't want to be gay. And it's, it's, it's really, as a community of trans amorous men, that's something we really have to start calling our, calling our brothers out on, and really, you know, just seeing it for what it is, calling it out. But um, I would just say that it's, it's really matured me, and, you know, I would even say earlier this year, um, I had to stop, like I came into this, you know, with, with the masculine, the cheese bow, and I was judging guys, like I, 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 I judged my brothers who were bottoms. And I was like, what? And, and, and now I'm just like, like I couldn't, I, I just, you know, with, and, and one of the guys ended up being a really close friend, one of my close friends ended up telling me about that. And I'm just like, well, I can't disrespect this man and not fuck with him because of this. And I'm fucked up for that. And I need to deal with that internally and move past that. And, and you know, it's just being real. Like, it, there, there's a lot of that in us. But um, I would just say this has really made me a better person and made me a lot more open to, 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 to things and ideas that I wasn't open to before. Um, it really just expanded my, my, my idea of masculinity. So... I agree with what Chris was sharing. Um, I feel really lucky in that, like, the majority of my friends who know that I'm trans amorous have, well, my friends kind of fall in like three different categories. There's like the folks who know and are like, yes, we affirm that, yo, good on you, all the things. And I feel really comforted and like guided by that energy. Then there are the folks who are kind of like, I don't know, but also I can see it. Like if I was to see it happen, I'm like, okay, that makes sense. That makes sense for you. And then there are the folks who just don't know either just by nature of them being an acquaintance or just not being close or just business partner, whatever the case may be. And in my experience with each of those kind of like classes, if you will, or like sections, whatever, there's this air of like approval or this affirmation of it. And I feel really lucky in that regard of having that experience, that exposure to such dope friends in that regard to be able to just be like, I'm just going to show up in this way and I'm not going to deny like my attractiveness or my attractiveness to my trans amory to this section of society, this group of people, 
like that's real for me. And to shut my myself off to that would be a denial of myself, of my humanity. And I wouldn't be true to myself. I wouldn't be true to the folks who I'm saying that I'm amorous to if I was to deny that in the pursuit of being this person that I think you want me to be or that I need to be in your eyes kind of thing. And it's like so many thoughts and I'm also like battling some melatonin. So rock with me y'all. Um, there, there was this other thought that I had. It was like, it has to do with the masculinity piece. It, for me, it was like opening up so many different worlds. It's like you take off the glasses or the blinders and that masculinity only has to be this one thing. It has to be what is, you know, identify as toxic. It has to be all these things. If you aren't doing X, Y, and Z, you're not a man, or you are a man if you're doing, or you don't cry, all these things. And it wasn't until I was just like, I'm going to be accepting of myself. I'm actually going to allow, like, it's going to be green lights for me. And once that happened, it was just like, okay, y'all still see me as who I am. And I can open up that definition of masculinity. I can start to kind of pave that way for folks who might be walking that path behind me to be like, okay, I see it. There's other avenues and I can still be a man in that. It doesn't necessarily have to be, oh, I have to be out here collecting women like trading cards kind of thing. There's, there's other definitions of masculinity that still fall under the umbrella, but isn't this narrow monolithic view of us. You know, I, I'll say, I'm, 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 you know, for good or for not, I'm a little bit definitely on the opposite side of a lot of my brothers. I'd say that I think I've spent most of my adult life trying to fit society's image of what a quote unquote successful black man um, looks like, which it, which includes the idea of respectability or masculinity. And because of that, there are a lot of folks in my life, whether they be cis, hetero, trans, that aren't aware of my amory. And that's just been, because, and that's and that's my own process. You know, I think today's dialogue that we have, I'm happy to be a participant, but I've also been a learner as we've had this conversation because I recognize that because of pressures across, you know, society and the ones that I've adopted and digested that I've not been, uh, I even told today, so I told somebody today that I was getting, um, I was gonna participate in this conversation and that turned into an hour conversation about like, I don't get it, why? Like, why is that something? Like, where did that come from? Why are you having those feelings? I mean, these aren't new feelings. Like, these are just, these are feelings that um, I am just now at 38 leaning into in a way that I feel like for years I had and tried to hide because I thought that it deterred me from being, fitting in this box of what success look like for the industries or the background that I came from. Um, you know, I think what I've tried to do in my space is press the conversation um, to try to build others' comfortability and what I've recognized so I can be more freeing with it and so I can release the own pressures on my own pressure, my own masculinity around it. And I can honestly say, I mean, I've been successful in some spaces and other spaces I'm not. So you know, it's a journey. You know, my takeaway, honestly, in this dialogue, and which I appreciate is um, there's definitely some work I need to do or some transparency I need to embody if I was to invite a system to this space um, because it's, it's complicated. Um, and so I'm not at the space where I think I've fully let go of the systemic pressures of masculinity um, in the way that would be helpful in that type of relationship. I love hearing all of these uh, growth stories. You know what I'm saying? I uh, definitely have my own growth story. I guess to start by answering the question, does did my Amory kind of change the way that I showed up as far as like my masculinity? Fuck yeah, fuck yeah it did. And I'll tell you why, if I can tell a quick story. Um, I am a, I'm an artist. I feel like a couple guys here are artists. You know, Jamie keeps referring to himself as a poindexter. I don't know why. He seems very cool and <laughs> put together. He looked like he had a nice ass place back there. So, I mean, I don't know why you call yourself a poindexter, but um, yeah, I feel like a couple of us are creatives here and I happen to be one of them. And all in my life, I always have been somebody who has been open. I've always been like somebody who's been leaning towards creativity and, and doing the shit that I fucking fuck with. Not as much as what other people want me to do. Of course, I had to 
um, conform to that to a certain degree, but up to high school, and you can ask anybody who knows me, by the time I was 11th and 12th, I was two steps out of that motherfucker. I was at a whole black school in Detroit, basically with skinny jeans on at a time when there was no such thing as skinny jeans. So you had to take a pretty girl with you to Forever 21 before they sold men's clothes to get a size seven or a size eight so that you can wear what is the equivalent of skinny jeans to the, you know what I mean, now. Back then you look at you like, oh my God, what is he doing? You know what I'm saying? You wear a, a, certain, kind of, a certain kind of clothing and they're like, wow, this guy is really out there. But the thing that saves it is the exact thing that saves modern rappers because that was probably 15 years ago. I'm, I was wearing some of this stuff, like some black nails, um, or I take my hair, I had an Afro, I would like hot comb it down so it would like come over my face because I wanted to, I was on in this emo kind of emo kind of thing going on. So it's like, I was doing these things that were stepping way off of the base of what people would um, associate with black masculinity. But the thing that saved me, saved me and saves these rappers now is that when it comes down to it, and it's the same thing with Prince, when it comes down to it conclusively, if you ask him or if you talk about his masculinity or if you try to see if he's like dating anybody outside of cis, het, women, that nigga will be ready to scrap or kill you. And like, that was the thing that like saved people from being able to be like, okay, now I can do this thing because in every other place, I am decidedly masculine. I am traditional. So I was the person who always was able to do that because you know, I mean, the gyms have been closed. You can't really see it, but I always was the guy who embodied this, 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 this um, stature that was like, okay, that's not really the guy that you really want to, you know, fight with. So, like, I had all of these boxes ticked as far as like what is considered to be masculine at a base level. But then when I started to talk about trans amory or talk about trans anything then you have one of the things, and it, it's fucked up that it is this way, but you have one of the major tenets of what is considered to be a real man. Now it is like, okay, now we're kind of questioning this very important box, which is who you lay with, who you put your dick in, or who do you love? And then if you, are, if you are viewed in a way that could be considered to be kind of gay with what you're doing and who you love, and then your presentation and masculinity is anything but regular, it's like, okay, nigga, you just gay. So for a long time, I was very much fighting this, this thing because it was a double-edged sword in the sense of that, if you would have asked me 10 years ago, and people always did, what is it that you like about trans women? What is it that you like about trans people? My answer used to originally be, I imagine that a person who has gone through some form of radical individualization and has understood who they are and understand their energy so deeply that they have done what they need to do to find and to live their most authentic self. I feel like a person like that will be able to look at another person who has some fluctuation or has any kind of, um, I don't want to say originality, but any kind of personal interpretation of themselves. I feel like a person who has gone through some sort of transition themselves would look at another person with a lot less rules and be like, okay, yeah, you know, this person is able to exist in their own way because I understand what it means to exist in your own way. Um, but then when I actually came back to America after leaving Asia, which I lived for seven years, and I started to be friends and start to be able to be in spaces and actually be able to have conversations with trans people in America, at least, um, it wasn't, I won't say that it's not the case, but it wasn't as much of the case as I thought. I thought that it would be a lot more grace extended to masculinity and like of the spectrum of all things from people who have experienced some kind of transition of their own. But in a lot of spaces, and I'm gonna just be real with, especially black trans women, like the way that you supposed to be, nigga, you supposed to be a nigga. I don't give a fuck if you talking about this or not. And that's what makes Conscious Lee, I, I hate to keep hating on my guy, but the thing is, because he is a straight up and down nigga, you can look in his eyes and tell that. That's what makes him so like, oh, wow, this is, this is a real man. You know what I'm saying? So for a long time, even though I was always the guy that was like, yo, I'm about to do these other things that are my own version, my own, um, my own way of showing up in the world, when I, when I found out that it wasn't just cis people who was checking my shit, it was also people who I was moving towards to be like, yo, you know what I'm saying, y'all probably get me. 
And he was like, actually, nigga, no, not everybody, of course. But some people are very binary in their presentation and they don't really even believe in that spectrum as much. It's kind of like, no, if you if you are trans woman, you need to be like this. And if you're a man, you need to be like this, period. That's the end. And when I kind of experienced that, I found myself in this position where I was like really like in turbulence, where I was trying to grab the wheel and make it, make it. I felt like even though the people who are the tastemakers of the fucking culture today are doing the shit I was doing damn near 20 years ago, I stopped doing it because I thought that I had to show up in a certain way where I'm like this straight up and down, you know what I'm saying, square guy, almost like Jamie is saying, like he's more of like a, you know, and when I look at him, it's like, bro, like, you know what I'm saying? You look like, boom, man, you know what I'm saying? And um, for a long time, I feel like I was trying to move back into this traditional idea of what it is to be a man or to show up as a man. So you see me on the gram, I'm like, and then that is an aspect of me. But it's like, I feel like now I'm coming into a space where it's more like, you know what? I'm on my shit. I have never not been, but I was just very, very conscious of how I would be potentially viewed by cis people, how I would be potentially viewed by trans people. And then you're stuck in this valley of death, it feels like, where it's like, damn, you know what I'm saying? If I lean this way, I'm gonna get burnt. If I lean this way, I'm gonna get burnt. But the real reality is, fuck it, burn me. God damn, I'm tired of playing that weak ass shit. It's really about being yourself. And, um, you know, it really did kind of make me do a lot of soul searching in that way. And I feel like it's been good for me. And um, it's not anymore about being likable. You know what I'm saying? It's not about that shit. I mean, I don't really give a fuck if people like me or not. I know I'm a jiggy ass nigga. I mean, come on, anybody who's looking at this can tell. But um, yeah, I know. I just feel like sometimes, even now to this day, and I've heard this several times, people will see me and they don't hear me talking. They don't see me moving. They might see a picture of me and they'd be like, oh, that's the Bush Queen. i like, oh, is he gay? You know what I'm saying? Because I'm not showing up with my hair shaved with a t-shirt on, with a beer in my hand at a, at a baseball game or a, or a football game. And it's like, okay, I have a little bit more to me. So it's like, okay, I don't know about that. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, I really don't give a fuck about that anymore. I mean, I would like for people to be able to see me as being whoever I am, but I really don't give a shit if people think that I'm gay. But it's it's always us as men, we try to find a way to not be, to not be called gay. And the thing is, I don't care as much, but it's kind of like when I first got my locks, and I don't want to talk for too long. When I first got my locks, people they would walk up to me and they say, yo, Rastaman, respect. Because nobody had dreads back then. But it didn't piss me off because it's like being Jamaican is not this fucking reprehensible thing to me. So when people think I'm gay, I really don't give a shit. But at the same time, I'm not. And so it's kind of like, I would like for y'all to understand that I'm not. But, you know, to bring it full circle, it did definitely make me have to think about how I show up because of the way that you're viewed from cis people and some trans people. Some cis people and some trans people. You know, I want to um, just add on to uh, just very quickly where Lex said he is right now, where he doesn't care how people think about him. I'm not 100% there. I don't going to sound like Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, you don't care how one Saturday or the other Saturday. I'm just saying, like, you, 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 you don't fear that judgment for being who you are. That is definitely one of my biggest regrets after I got into this is that I waited so long. Is that I waited way too late in my life to, to get my shit together and really accept myself and move forward in my dreams. I, 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 my hat, hats off to all the young brothers out there that are doing it in their 20s. I didn't start until I was like 30, 31. And, and you know, I just, it, those previous 10 years, it, it really does feel like waste of time. I'm sorry, Brother Malawi. Go ahead, man. Sorry to interrupt that. It's uh, it's very interesting because um, I know that I'm an outlier in that in that sense in in this conversation of uh, uh, black trans amorous men or just black men um, kind of leading into their their own self identified queerness because um, I've had a completely uh, uh, different experience. I've been raised by all women. My mom is a lesbian. I've been raised by two women. Um, my sister is a lesbian. Like I, I've, I've always been in the arts. I, I never gave a fuck my entire life. I, it's always been instilled in me. Like you are who you are, 
and that's it. How other people see you is how people see you. Even even when you know who you are, people still have these perceptions and these 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 labels, these I, these ideas of who you are. And so I've never navigated life, love, relationships with this 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 fear of like, oh, if I appear less of a um, of, of a man or less masculine, then that like I've never ever had that. Um, but what's interesting, and also an, another kind of like flip side experience that I, I have in terms of this conversation of of, of um, a, a black trans amory uh, with well, my experience with women in general. Uh, black women <laughs> is that on the flip side they have a, a lot of times in my experience they have those ideas and so when they look at someone like me without speaking to and understanding you know how I may identify or what what my politics on love and relationships and all of that shit is they I'm automatically canceled out as as not an option so even in some ex the, the cases of me feeling a black trans woman, I was not even in that range of, of people that they could see dating because I, I wasn't I, I wasn't a man man. And because I wasn't a man man that made them feel or it, it, it fed into this idea that they're not a woman woman, which which I understand will, could very much invalidate um, their trans experience. And so when I, I talk about um, it's not my job to validate and all of that stuff. It's coming from this idea that I never gave a fuck. I never had to go through this journey of like, you know, letting go of the church and this and that. Like I never gave a fuck. I've always been an artist. I've always been who I was and how I understand myself and how I may or may not even identify is, is, is all of the self and what other people perceive of me is a separate thing. Uh, and that's been my experience. So I, it's I, it, it's very interesting uh, hearing all of the stories because I've heard these stories even outside of the the, the trans Amory uh, conversation, whether it is uh, uh, gender expression or their career choice or whatever. I've heard these conversations from Black men because we've been indoctrinated to to subscribe to a particular type of masculinity, which inherently is white, um, but. I, that's never been my experience. And so um, it, it, it's very interesting because I, I don't even, I, I am pushed out of the door most of the times, whereas I think most black men in a context of trans amory are fighting to themselves to even get in the door to even know or understand what it's like to, to, to uh, be in relation to someone who is a, a trans person or a trans woman, a black trans woman at that. Uh, so that's that's interesting. I um I think that what I've learned here from all of you, and I think that Malui, you summarized it really well, because that was something that I had to learn a couple of years back. That like I can't lean on my partner's expression of who they are to validate my experience because that was very much so a big issue that I had that I didn't know was an issue until I was called out. And it was just like, I'm gonna be me over here. Like you gotta figure out who you are. And you know, you have to be happy in that. And that has to resonate for you in a way that helps us to feed each other. Like that helps us to become a rechargeable battery versus you sucking all this life out of me to affirm you constantly that you're a woman. Like. I'm with you because I like who you are. And if you say that you're a woman, then that's what I'm affirming on a constant basis. But um, I think as, a, as, as trans women, what a lot of us do have to do, there is this, in, this unindoctrination period of like unrealizing a bunch of things that you thought were true about yourself and realizing things that you now feel like, okay, you have to encompass. And then unrealizing some of those things to create the woman that you are and the woman that you wanna be versus the woman or the way that femininity is supposed to show up in the world, right? And then finally settling on, okay. Hey everybody, this is Hope and I don't really like putting on wigs all the time. <laughs> like, you know, like, and, and, and that that's a thing that it took me forever to learn because there was a, a point in my life where I felt like in order for men to like me, my tits have to be pushed up to my neck. 
they have to be visible. I have to have on makeup. My hair has to be the best hair in the room. And then slowly but surely, I started to unlearn those things. And I started to do women, womanhood in a way that made more sense to me. Now, my tits are always still pushed up to my neck because I like them. But that's because I like them, you know? And, and that's because that's what works for me, not because it's what I feel like I have to do to be affirmed as a woman. And I think that if if my sisters who are watching this don't learn anything else from that, I think that it's that it's not these men's job to make us feel like a woman and trying to de to de um devalidate who they are as men in order to make your fel- yourself feel more like a woman is an act of, of of pure and utter fucking hatred, and you wouldn't want it to be done to you, right? Um, I say it all the time that like my favorite type of, of men are soft boys because I don't like the idea of not being able to joke with my partner about possibly being a fucking butch queen. I don't like when I'm having a conversation <laughs> with my partner and I'm like, bitch, and he like, man, I'm just not. like, n- nigga, chill out. Like, we, it's just us. Like, you know, like, I, and, and it's one of those things where I feel like. I connect better with men who connect better with the idea of knowing who they are versus performing who they are. Because when you're performing, I I can snatch that curtain down at any point in time and you're offended by every little thing that I say. But when you know- It's low-key dangerous when somebody be performing because if you snatch it down, you don't know what the fuck I'm- I don't know what the fuck. And and that's the thing, like you never know what the fuck is going to be behind there. And so I think I want to challenge my sisters to just like- I know that it's appeal. It's never been. Really, it's never really been appealing for me. I've always been like a an artist chaser. Mm-hmm. Um, I've always been the the person that was. I was. Oh, you gonna bring a white girl home? And then you know when I came out, it's like, oh, you gonna bring a white boy home? You know, whatever kind of deal. So I've always had like an affinity for men who lived on this very um, sort of like I'm gonna do me sort of spectrum. And I think that as trans women, I want to challenge a lot of us to rework the way that we feel like men have to be in order to affirm us, because I think that then we'll be able to be in a lot more healthy and happy and loving friendships, right, first, and then relationships second, because we'll be being with people who do, like you said, Malou, and like you've been saying, know themselves. And then like you said, Lex, there, I think the protection and stuff will come more naturally when you're allowing somebody to protect you in the way that they understand protection versus the way that you want them to perform protection so that you can look like, you know, this woman. Um, But you all, this has been an amazing and fruitful, and I'm just like, I'm gonna have to go back through this conversation for, you know, a a couple of different times to pick up on some things because y'all have, Y'all have snatched my wig several times and I, I've just had to like eat it real quick. But um, I want to know if y'all can give like a, a little 30 second elevator speech real quick to the people. What is it that you want to let whatever your chosen group, be it trans women, be it other trans amorous men, what is it that you want to leave them with in this moment to kind of take with them to the gym, to their car, to whatever event they're going to? Um, what is it that you wish that somebody would have kind of bestowed upon you sooner um, to, I guess, help them, whether it be trans women, cis people, other guys, like, what is it that you just want to leave people, a little 30 second elevator speech? I'll go real quick, so I got to hop off in a a quick second, but I'll just say my quick thing is to uh, my trans sister, there are brothers out here who love you wholly and fully and who are willing to put their self, their beings in the line. Um, And so just, I think the hope's last point, be open to who you see and who you recognize um, because we are here. Um, And the second thing I would say to my brothers and I I think to uh, some of the things that we've talked about is, you know, lean into, you know, to to live your life free of performance and kind of heaviness of society is, is a gift. And if you can figure out how to give yourself that early in your life, You'll save your life. You'll save yourself a lot of time and energy later on. So try to find what that piece looks like for yourself. I appreciate y'all, family. I gotta head off. So y'all, y'all be well, okay? Peace, peace. Um, I guess I'll go next. Uh, elevator speech, okay. 
first piece, I would say uh, know who you are and uh, continue that journey of learning who you are. And if you if there are things that you don't know about yourself or things you should communicate, things that you think about, communicate that with any person that you're in relationship with. That's the first point. Second point is don't give a fuck. <laughs> the things that you're learning about yourself, don't give a fuck about how people are, are perceiving you, if it feels healthy and it feels good and you're self-affirming yourself. Um, that energy is gonna be felt uh, from other people. The third point is, I, and that last point was more specific to black uh, trans amorous men or black men in general, don't give a fuck, let go. A uh, third point would be more so towards uh, black trans women is um, also let go. Let go of this idea of, of what men should look like. Open your, continue the work of opening yourself up of, uh, of, of love that can uh, serve you in a way that a lot of, I won't say a lot, but men are actually out here um, willing to share and um, you might not be able to see because of X, Y, and Z. So those would be my takeaways. I guess I'll go next then. Okay. I'll go next. No, I was just keeping it short and sweet. Is um, I'm just it really just to the ladies. Um, there are like the other guys formerly said, there are men out there who will love you, protect you, all that stuff. All I'm saying is, please do whatever work you have to do to get yourself to a space where you're ready for that love, because. Not everybody's ready and you don't want to miss that opportunity when your man show up. So please, please be ready. Be ready to be loved. Accept yourself and get yourself mentally to a place where it'd be all good. So it's all good. Um, yeah, I guess that I will kind of say reverberate what y'all were saying, uh, especially Malui. Yo, uh, I know it sounds easier said than done to not give a fuck, but yo, Jess, you can give some fucks but don't give them all up. You know what I'm saying? This is your life. Like it's it's really something powerful about being yourself. If you are young, especially if you're an artist, it's like, yo, the people who are leading the culture are doing whatever the fuck they want to do. You think they got there by being the same as everybody else? That's just not how it goes. So you have to just embody your own shit and just, just um, be yourself, whatever that is. I see a huge push um, towards um, accepting things that otherwise would have been considered not allowed for men are more and more being allowed now as far as fashion like you see even like Deontay Wilder or like big big athletes and they got on beautiful floral jackets and like you know he's fighting in sequin trunks so it's like it, it's really a time if if there ever was a time the time is now the time has been since the beginning of time but the time is definitely now to just embrace all of the energy that is happening Embrace yourself. Do that shit. Do that shit. Do that shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, it breaks down in like two main parts to my trans amorous brothers. Um, before you can be an ally to anyone, you have to be an ally to yourself. And seeing those aspects of your humanity, your amorous, your attractiveness to these beings, you almost owe it to yourself to explore that. You owe it to your ancestors who fought tooth and nail to like see to it that your existence is allowed, that you are here. And to stunt that on behalf of someone else's perception of you for whatever reason is a disservice to yourself and to them. And uh, to my trans sisters, my sisters, I see you, I love you, you matter. Um, yeah, I want you around. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was singing a little snow or like in the background. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, with that being said, you all, I hope that everybody who was able to watch this and who has listened to both parts of this, because it's definitely going to be a part one and two, that you were fed both spiritually, emotionally, mentally. I hope that part of this conversation has made you grow, even as somebody who is considered a frontline runner in the movement, I've grown from this conversation. Um, I've been challenged during this conversation. My views and my thought processes, as I thought that they would be, were challenged in this conversation and I've been able to come out 
a better person and a better advocate, not just for myself, but for the men that I want to ultimately love. Um, my work isn't just about uplifting and empowering trans women. It's about empowering anybody who is here for us and anybody who is willing to put themselves, you know, in harm's way, whether it be via the internet, in person, at a march, at a rally, with your family. I'm, I'm here for anybody that is willing to do that for the betterment and the love and the appreciation of who I am as a person, who my sisters are and who my brothers are and my siblings are as people. Um, so I just wanna thank all of these amazing men for coming and sharing and giving so much of their time to have this very taxing and triggering fucking conversation um and without further ado like i said this time and every time you all peace love and hope and uh i'll see y'all next week bye guys